Okay, so in the last few classes, we looked at some applications of constraint satisfaction. In particular, we looked at model based diagnosis and how one can sort of use constraints in the process, modeling of devices and searching for faults in this. Today, uh, I want to start looking at uh, another popular activity which is domain independent planning uh, and see how we can transform it into a constraint satisfaction problem or to a sad problem essentially. Okay. So, what has happened in the world of planning uh, is that people have moved towards a two stage approach where they transform the problem into something different and then solve that essentially. So, we will see a couple of examples of that. So, it is possible that some of you may not have exposure to planning and some of you might have done my course on artificial intelligence uh, search methods. But nevertheless, I will start with a very quick and brief introduction to planning and then we will see how we can transform a planning problem into a uh, constraints satisfaction problem. So, essentially in planning, there is an agent who is trying to solve certain problems because the agent has certain objectives and the problems are in a given domain which has to be described uh, using some language. Then the agent can perceive uh, what is true in the domain and the agent can act in the domain essentially. And some people have called uh, planning as the reasoning side of acting. Which basically means that of course, the agent wants to do some actions, but the agent wants to do it in an intelligent fashion or after some deliberation and the deliberation that the agent does is called planning essentially. So, planning can happen, the activity of planning can happen in different levels of complexity. Uh, you know, there may be other agents who are acting or actions may have durations or the perception may not be complete or actions may not be deterministic, but we we will focus on the simplest of all possible domains, which sometimes have been called as the strips domain of planning in which actions are instantaneous and deterministic and there is nobody else changing the world. And in this world, we will focus on the task on of planning and it turns out that even in this simple strips world, planning is a hard problem. It is P space complete, which means that it requires exponential time and polynomial space essentially. Now, typically because we are want to look at domain independent uh, algorithms, we need a mechanism to describe every domain and that is done by domain description languages and, and there is a whole class of languages called planning domain description languages. So, PDDL <coughs> are the simplest of them is the strips language essentially. So, we talk about a domain called blocks world, which we will see very briefly, in which there is an infin infinitely large table on which many blocks are kept and blocks are all of the same size so, and they can be kept on one on top of the other. And such a domain is described by a set of predicates. So, the predicate on table says that a blocks x is on the table on x y says that block x is on blocks y block y clear x says that uh, there is nothing on top of block x and holding x says that there is a robot holding the x and we are going to work with a one armed robot which is going to do the manipulation for us. Arm empty says that the robot is not holding anything. So, we have to describe the domain using predicates and then we have to describe the actions that are possible in the, in the domain. The actions are typically described by a set of conditions which are necessary for the action to so, actions are described typically by a set of preconditions which should be true in the domain for the action to be applicable and a set of effects which become true after the action is applied essentially. So, the planner can reason with the different actions available and see which of them are applicable and then somehow choose between one of them essentially. So, one of the actions in the blocks world domain is called unstack x from y. And you can see that the preconditions for that is that the robot arm must be empty, which is given by arm empty. Then x must be on y if you want to unstack it from y. 
and there must be nothing on top of x essentially. If this conditions are true then you can do unstack and if you do unstack then the arm will no longer be empty because you would be holding that x. So, this holding x will be true and x will be no longer on y because you have picked it up from there and as a result y will also become clear in the sense nothing is on top of y. So, in the slips blocks world domain there are four actions. So, un, we have just seen unstack there is a similar action called pick up which says that you pick up from the table and then there are two actions for putting down you can either put it down on the table which is called put down or you can stack it onto another block which is called stack a on b essentially. Now, a lot of work uh, in the in, in planning has happened in something called plan space in which you search in a space of plans and I am using this diagram only to depict as to what is a plan. So, a valid plan is something which takes the given state and transforms it into a desired state. So, in this small example that we are looking at the given state says that B is on C, C is on the table, A is on the table and the desired state is that A should be on B for example. And and this what you see here is a is a is a start is a valid plan for that. Now, if you look at the problem what is the solution for this problem that you should first unstack B from C and then you should put it down on the table. So, that you can see this is the first action is to unstack B from C the second action is to put down B on the table. The third action is to pick up A from the table uh, and then stack it onto B. So, these four actions will achieve the desired state that you have on the right hand side and in this representation of the plan which happens in plan space planning this ordering of the actions is shown by these, these arrows that we see which say that this is the sequence in which you are doing the actions and the fact that the preconditions are true are given by these so called causal, link, causal links. So, for example, if you have on table B as a as something that is a goal that you want then that is achieved by the fact that you have put down B on the table essentially. A lot of work has happened in what we call as state space planning which is like this. So, on the left hand side you see the given state it may be a large state in which there are many blocks and the desired situation or the goal description basically says that all you care about is that G must be on A and B must be on J and you do not care about anything else which means that any state in which these two propositions are true is a goal state and the task of planning is to find uh, uh, a plan which will transform this in, uh, into a goal state essentially. The given state as you can see is always completely known the goal state may be partially known. So, what we are seeing here uh, in this box is a textual description of the pictorial space that we see on the top. So, the first line says that the arm is empty which means that there is nothing being held by the this thing. Then this second line is basically talking about the first stack uh, on the table. It says that, that B is on the table that A is on B and there is nothing on A and the other four lines describe uh, the other stacks which are on the table essentially. One thing that you could do is to do forward state space search which means that from the given state you explore what possible actions are there. So, if you look at the given state which is the state that is given to the start state in this you can unstack A from B which is depicted here as a option uh, that the planner can do or you can unstack C from D which is shown here and likewise the other 5 other 4 actions you can unstack F from G or you can pick up J from the table or you can unstack K from L or you can unstack P from Q. Now, you have these 6 possible actions and in every 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 after every move you have many such actions. So, one of the problems with forward state space planning is that it is generates a huge tree which people have tried to sort of address by doing something like heuristic search, but that is something that we will not go into in this course here. The other option is to do backward state space search and backward state space search is attractive because of the fact that it is low branching and the branching is low because you are only focusing on the goals that have been specified to you that you the only thing you care about is that G is on A and B is on J and therefore, you are looking for actions which will make those true essentially. So, for example, on G A can be made true by stacking G onto A 
and on bj can be made true by stacking b onto j and the backward state space search algor algorithm only explores these two actions in a backward fashion. But it has its own problems essentially. So, as listed on this slide here, one of the problems is uh, that for example, you might the backward reasoning might say that to achieve on b j here, I have to do stack b, stack b on j which is true of course, but if you stack b onto j if you think in the forward direction, then you will end up having on b on b j true, but at the same time you end up having holding g true. How can that be possible? How can you how, how can you because to stack p j you must be holding b and you have a one armed robot. If you are holding b and you are putting down b onto j, how can you end up holding g essentially? So, that is not possible. So, these kind of spurious events happen in backward state space planning and things like if you look at this simple problem where you have a b c and you have to stack them up together this searching in the backward direction it says that okay, the last action can be stack a on to b because that will make my stack a b true and then the second last action can be stack b on to c because uh, that will make on b c true and then because I need to be holding a uh, I can do pick up a to satisfy this and then because I need to be holding b I can do pick up b to satisfy this and then you find that everything is in the given state, but this clearly is not a valid plan because you cannot do pick up b and then you cannot do pick up a because your hand is no longer empty essentially. So, backward states uh, space search produces this kind of plans essentially. Okay. So, around 1995 or so uh, two scientists uh, by the name of Blum and first gave this algorithm called graph plan which kind of changed the whole planning community. Uh, uh, because it could solve much bigger and bigger problems. In fact, it could produce plans which were of order of magnitude bigger than earlier methods could essentially. So, the first difference between graph plan and the earlier methods is that it is a two stage process. Uh, it first constructs what we can call as a planning graph and the difference between planning graph and the earlier state space approach was that if in this small state that you can see where there are these three blocks and there are two possible actions you can pick up c or you can unstack a from b you can end up in two different states. In one state uh, you are holding C and in the other state you are holding A essentially because you have unstacked A from B. What graph plan does that in the planning graph both these for example, holding C and holding A it should be somewhere here yeah, they are part of the same layer. So, it does not build states it builds layers and it may contain um, predicates which cannot be true at the same time. So, it has to worry about that and that it does by introducing something called mutex relations uh, between elements of a layer. So, in this graph you can see that this is a the, the, the p 0 is the starting layer, then a 1 is the first action layer, p 1 is the first proposition layer after the starting layer a 2 is the second action layer and p 2 is the second proposition layer. It builds us this graph left to right. As it builds the graph, it identifies things which are not feasible together. So, for example, you cannot pick up c and you can unstack a from b at the same time because you have a one armed robot and like we observed in the last slide, you cannot be holding c and you cannot be holding a at the same time because you can only hold one thing at a time. And so, it identifies these kind of relations within a layer and these layers these relations are called mutex edges essentially. And they are of course, play a role in solving them because if you are trying to look for a solution then no, no state can have mutex predicates or mutex actions in them essentially. So, that is a that is a that is done in the backward phase which is the harder phase of uh, solving the planning problem and which is what we are trying to now target by saying that okay, we will try to convert this into a constraint satisfaction problem. What the original algorithm graph plan given by first and Blum did, did was that the moment when you reach a situation where all your goal predicates are present in a layer and they are non mutex, you start a backward search process to see that if there is a valid sequence of actions which can produce 
these goals essentially. So, they may be one of these paths may actually lead to the start state which means that if you follow that those sequence of actions. So, every action first that first action here then some action here and so on and so forth uh, you will end up a plan essentially and it does this. So, why it has to do all these different kind of searches is because it has to avoid non mutex uh, it has to avoid uh, those subsets which are so so every subset that it is looking at must be not must not contain any mutexes so it has to try and do search and what the original algorithm did was backtrack that first search which is like the backtracking algorithm that we are been uh, following in the csp essentially and this kind of motivates us to convert uh, the backward phase of the of the graph plan algorithm into a constraint satisfaction problem later on we will see that you do not have to go via the planning graph, but you can also formulate a constraint satisfaction problem independently this thing. But let us for the moment focus on on converting the planning graph into a CSP essentially and that takes us into this domain of planning as constraint satisfaction. So, the first thing that we have observed is that the search process employed by graph plan is similar to the backtracking procedure of solving the CSPs, okay. but there are other things which you can see which has similarities with solving CSPs is that people have tried to use the look ahead me methods that we have studied in CSP. So, for example, forward checking and things like that essentially. Then graph plan employs something called memorization uh, which basically says that during the backwards phase of searching if it sees a combination which is not feasible then it remembers that essentially and which is exactly what we did in when we did no good learning in CSPs essentially. Then the mutex relations that we talked about in 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 the layers are like our consistency requirements that uh, cons that constraint satisfaction problems have essentially and it has been observed. So, now, graph plan uses only binary mutexes that they are mutex only between two things either two actions or two propositions, but if we use higher order mu mutex relations then it has been observed that the backward search phase would be bound to succeed which means it would be backtrack free and this is something that we have also observed in in, in CSPs which says that if in appropriate amount of i consistency uh, on a constraint network will make the search backtrack free essentially. Okay. So, their problems are quite similar and therefore, it is uh, natural to to pose it as a CSP. Now, the advantage of posing it as a CSP is that you do not have to write a separate search algorithm that you can just take some off the shelf, shelf CSP solver and that will hopefully solve the problem for you. Now, one of the ways that we can convert this problem into a CSP is to use something called a dynamic CSP in which the number of variables is dynamic and this is done by using a unary constraint which is called active which says which proposition is active or which participates in a solution or not essentially. And so, in a dynamic CSP which is we call as DCSP only a subset of the variables are active and the task is to find a satisfying assignment only for those variables essentially. So, we will see how we identify the active variables essentially. We start with the goal propositions. The goal certainly should be true because we want it to be true and therefore, we must find uh, values for the goal propositions proposition we will see that values in this formulation are actions. So, we must be able to find actions which will make the goal propositions true. So, initially the the goal propositions in the final layer are marked active and their values which we will see are actions are chosen then once you choose an action then action has a precondition and then you mark those preconditions also as active essentially. So, that is how you add more variables or you make more variables active as you start from the backward phase of the this thing. So, what are the variables uh, in the dynamic CSP? So, if the goal for example, in this small problem is that you want that this is the starting state that B is on C and, and A is on the table and you want A to be on C, then the active propositions are on A C must be true and on, on table C must be C true. So, this on T is just a short form for on table C must be true essentially. Now, the variables of the constraint satisfaction problem are the propositions that occur in the layers P 1 and P 2 
supposing we have constructed the planning graph only for two layers so far and their domains are the actions in the planning graph that produce them essentially. So, in the notation that we will see in a moment, uh, the subscript will refer to the layer in which the proposition occurs. So, clear, when you say clear 2 A, it basically means that we are looking at the proposition clear A and in layer 2 essentially. So, when we say clear 1 B for example, we are saying that we are looking at the proposition clear B and it is in layer 1. So, these are all the propositions which occur in the planning graph and these are the variables that could participate in the solution. The values for the variables are the actions again from the planning graph essentially that produce them. So, for example, if you have on table C in the planning graph at layer 2, then this could have been produced by something called a no op. No op basically says that uh, it has it is not you are not doing anything. So, a no op action is essentially says that uh, if you have a proposition P uh, that is a precondition for a no op action and the effect of this action is nothing but P. So, essentially you are not doing anything to that predicate. So, on table C could have been produced by a no op or it could have been produced by put down action essentially or that if you are saying that the arm is empty in layer 2, it could have been empty in the previous layer or it could have been become empty if because you stacked A on to B or it could have been empty because you stacked A on to C or it could have been empty because you stacked C on to A and so on. So, the planning graph will have all these options and they become the variables that uh, the values that the variables can take. The variables are propositions, the active propositions and the values are actions and we have the variables in the initial uh, layer as you can see which are clear uh, layer 0 and they can just have some dummy action because you know you do not really need to find actions for them. Okay, so, next thing that you have to worry about is the mutex relation since actions are not variables in this, but they are values of variables. Action mutexes are modeled by constraints between the corresponding proposition variables. So, remember there are actions like you cannot pick up C and you cannot unstack A from B at the same time. So, if two actions in the layer are mutex, so we are talking about actions in the planning graph are mutex, then the two propositions in that layer cannot simultaneously take those actions as values essentially. So, for example, if you want to say that action pick up C and action unstack A from B are mutex, then you are saying that if pick up C is a value for holding C because pick up C results in holding C and unstack A B is a value for the variable holding A. So, holding C and holding A are variables and the actions are their values that they cannot be true at the same time. So, essentially we express this as a constraint which says that if holding C is takes a value pick up C then, so this is the implication sign then holding A cannot take the value of unstack B. So, you transform this into uh, mutexes on the corresponding variables essentially. So, how do you construct assemble the, the dynamic CSP? As we said we start with the goal propositions and in this goal that we have that A should be on C and C should be on the table, we have two propositions uh, which say that uh, in the layer 2 these are true. So, we are assuming that we will find a plan of length 2 here. The goal propositions are regressed to sub goal propositions by a set of activity constraints. Activity constraints basically relate propositions actions to preconditions. So, we are saying that if action P i takes a value A i, then A i is the name of that action. Uh, then the preconditions of that action A in the layer i minus 1 should be made active essentially. So, for example, if you are saying that uh, that on A C the proposition on A C is made true by the action stack A C which is a value for that variable. So, this is a variable and that is a value. Then you make the preconditions of the stack which are that you must be holding A and clear C must be clear as active in the previous layer. So, on A C is true in second layer and so these must be true in the first layer essentially. Likewise, if you want to say that on table C is true because of put down C and this is became true in layer 2, 
then in layer 1 you must be holding C. So, you make that as active essentially. So, these are called activity constraints and this help. So, they make more and more variables active essentially. Finally, the mutex relations between uh, propositions is straightforward. You simply say that on, that both of both cannot be true at the same time. So, you can express it as a logical constraint like this that it cannot be the case that, that q i and p i is active at the same time or you can express it as an implication which says that if you say active q i that means you are saying not active p i, but both are equivalent statements. So, a simple procedure for solving the DSP will need to start with assigning values to active variables and then proceed in backtracking like manner essentially. So, remember that, that, that we are just replacing the backward phase of graph plan here with this constraint satisfaction problem, which means that we already have received, uh, we, have, we already have got the goal propositions as non mutex in the in the kth layer and from that point onwards we start this process essentially. So, we start with the goal propositions and then uh, we, we do in a backtracking like fashion considering one new active variable at a time looking for its action, adding the preconditions of those uh, action as more active variables and then you can do depth first search like this thing which is what this was done here. Okay, so, in this problem, so this process actually mimics the backward depth first search procedure which is adopted by graph plan. So, this was about a dynamic uh, CSP. It is also possible to convert this into a standard CSP. So, now a dynamic CSP remember is, is contains two kind of variables, one which are active which participate in the solutions and one which are not active essentially. Instead you can consider all the solutions and do the following that uh, one can mark variables which are not active by adding another value to the domain of all these variables. So, in fact to the domain of all variables and this value is uh, often called false or bottom and this is a symbol that we use borrowed from logic and essentially we are saying that a proposition p is active if and only if it does not have the value which is bottom essentially. Now, all the propositions in the layers, all the proposition in all the layers are treated equally, they all participate in the solution finding process and the only difference now is that in the solution only the active variables are assigned values and the rest are assigned a value of false or bottom essentially. So, every active variable in the DSP is replaced by a constraint which says that it cannot be bottom essentially. So, that kind of concludes uh, uh, this approach of converting uh, the planning graph into a dynamic CSP or for that matter a standard CSP. In the next class, we will look at how we can adopt an approach which from first principles takes a planning problem and converts it into a constraint satisfaction problem and that uses a slightly different representation which we call as a state variable representation, but we will take that up in the next class. Mm -hmm.